Quantum mechanics, the crown jewel of modern science and an infinite inspiration for technology. While names like Max Planck and Albert Einstein are often hailed as their founders, the true beginning started with a challenge by German physicist Gustav Kirchhoff. Unfortunately, this part of the history is seldom mentioned in the discussions of quantum mechanics. What followed was a relentless pursuit by some of the greatest minds in history, Stefan, Boltzmann, Wien, and finally, Planck. This video is dedicated to this fascinating hidden history, which eventually led to the birth of quantum mechanics by Planck and Einstein. The story begins in 1850 with Gustav Kirchhoff, whom you might know from his famous circuit laws on electricity. However, he is also particularly renowned for establishing the field of spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is one of the most significant and unexpected of the new sciences that came out of the mid-19th century. This field would allow scientists to determine not only the chemical makeup of the laboratory materials, but also of the sun and stars, which many people had thought would forever lie beyond the pale of human inquiry. Kirchhoff was born on 12 March 1824 in Königsberg, Prussia. By 1845, while still a student at Heidelberg University, he had already formulated the circuit laws that bear his name. Later, alongside his colleague Robert Bunsen, yes, the same Bunsen behind the Bunsen burner, Kirchhoff worked extensively on spectroscopy, optics, and thermodynamics. In 1875, Kirchhoff accepted Berlin's first chair dedicated specifically to theoretical physics. After Kirchhoff's appointment, Berlin soon transformed into a hub for innovation in physics. Indeed, after Kirchhoff retired, the position was taken up by none other than Max Planck. Before his Berlin years while still in Heidelberg, Kirchhoff had become fascinated by a deceptively simple question, how do heated bodies radiate? At the time, atoms and electrons hadn't yet been discovered, so the question was anything but straightforward. Then, in July 1860, he published a groundbreaking paper on the thermodynamics of light. In it, he posed a challenge to both theorists and experimentalists to uncover a universal function that could describe this radiation. So, what was Kirchhoff's challenge? It was deceptively simple. Find the ratio between a black body's radiating and absorbing power. What made the challenge so interesting was that Kirchhoff found the ratio should be the same for all materials, no matter the composition thus pointing to something much more fundamental. To further understand the challenge, we need to get a hold of two slightly technical topics, absorption of radiation and emission. Interestingly, even in the early 1700s, Isaac Newton had already touched on this. In optics, he asked, do not all fixed bodies, when heated beyond a certain degree, emit light and shine? And is not this emission performed by the vibrating motion of its parts? As usual, Newton was on the right track. First. Let's begin with how radiation gets absorbed, and the emission of radiation turns out to be just the reverse. Some materials, like glass, hardly seem to absorb light at all. The light goes right through. A shiny metallic surface doesn't absorb the light, it gets reflected. For a black material like soot, light and heat are almost entirely absorbed, and the material gets warm. What is the theory to explain it? Light is an electromagnetic wave, so when it interacts with the charges in the material, it causes these charges to oscillate and absorb energy from the radiation. It turns out that, for glass, these charges are tightly bound to atoms and can only oscillate at certain frequencies, so most visible light passes through and little energy is absorbed. On the other hand, Metal has electrons that are free to move. This is what makes a metal a metal. These free electrons can easily oscillate with the incoming light wave. According to Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, oscillating charges emit light waves. And this emitted light wave is called radiation, and we call it reflected. Some materials, such as soot, have properties between glass and metals. They are substances that don't transmit or reflect light. Instead, it absorbs it. There are free charges, not as free as in metals, but also not bound as in glass. These charges constantly bump into another atom and lose energy, which causes such materials to be heated. Having understood how the radiation gets absorbed, what about the reverse? Why does it radiate when heated? When heated, these charges inside the soot move around and bounce off nearby atoms. These bounces cause the charges to accelerate, and according to Maxwell's theory, accelerating charges emit electromagnetic radiation. Therefore, 
soot efficiently emits radiation when heated. It is evident from considerations like this that good radiation absorbers are also good emitters. This was Kirchhoff's main conclusion. A body emits radiation at a given temperature and frequency exactly as well as absorbs the same radiation. This technique, a cornerstone of astronomy, is used to determine the chemical composition of distant stars, galaxies, and even exoplanet atmospheres. Suppose a star emits light of all frequencies. It will have a continuous spectrum. If there is a cold gas cloud in the path, it will absorb light of specific frequencies and cause a gap in the spectrum known as absorption lines. The same gas alone would emit radiation of the same frequency it absorbed known as emission lines. So, yes, the frequencies absorbed and emitted by a particular atom or molecule are identical. This finding also goes by the name Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff actually considered a slightly special setup. Let's explore it in detail. For this, imagine two thin metal plates placed parallel to each other. Each has its own emissive and absorptive power. One of the plate surfaces is a perfectly reflecting mirror. When light gets emitted from one plate, it can either be absorbed by the opposing plate or reflected back. This process leads to an infinite series of reflections as the radiation bounces back and forth between the two metals. Over time, the system achieves a thermal equilibrium. At this point, Kirchhoff arrived at a remarkably simple yet profound result. The ratio of emissive power to absorptive power must be exactly equal for both metal plates. Even more striking is that this result remains valid if the second plate is replaced by another metal with entirely different emissive and absorptive properties. This led Kirchhoff to a general conclusion. For a given temperature and wavelength, the ratio of emissive power to absorptive power is the same for all bodies. In other words, this ratio is a universal function, depending only on the frequency and temperature of the radiation and not on the specific atomic or material composition of the emitting body. This insight later proved to be crucial for Planck's work on blackbody radiation. Since the function was universal, Planck could model the metal as a simple system of harmonic oscillators, essentially a toy model, and still trust that his results applied to real materials regardless of their microscopic details. In fact, Planck's breakthrough work on black body radiation in 1900 is a direct solution to the challenge proposed by Kirchhoff 50 years before. In the same paper, Kirchhoff imagined an object that absorbed all the radiation falling upon it. He called this black body and its absorptive power would be exactly one. Such a body would reflect no light at all, nor allows light to pass. But how could one possibly construct such a black body? Kirchhoff had a brilliant idea. He realized that an opaque oven with a small hole in its wall would serve as an excellent absorber. Any radiation entering the hole would bounce around inside, losing energy with each reflection until it gets eventually absorbed. And here's the key insight. According to Kirchhoff's law, a perfect absorber is also a perfect emitter. This meant that such an oven wouldn't just absorb radiation efficiently, it would also emit it just as effectively, making it an excellent real-world approximation of a black body. Indeed, such a whole ROM can even be constructed from cardboard, as shown by Purcell's Black Body Box, a whole ROM demonstrator. Contrary to what one might expect, the black body isn't necessarily black. Rather than being dark, a black body emits a rich and continuous spectrum. Stars, despite not being enclosed in boxes, serve as excellent black body approximations, and so do hot metal bars and bulb filaments. Many objects emit light like imperfect black bodies. The most prominent among them is, of course, our sun. Its spectrum, first measured in the early 19th century by Fraunhofer, is well approximated by that of a black body of temperature between 5,500 and 6,000 Kelvin. It does display deviations from it, the so-called Fraunhofer line, but it is indisputable that, although very dissimilar from an oven with a tiny hole, the sun qualifies as an imperfect black body. Indeed, Kirchhoff actually got interested in spectroscopy after reading the work of Fraunhofer. This observation hints at what a black body really is, a body with a rich energy spectrum, capable of exciting light across all frequencies through thermalization. The most perfect black body spectrum ever observed is the one from a cosmic microwave background, CMB, that originates from photons emitted when our universe was just born. Interestingly, these CMBs are also present in the old TV static. Since the CMB is a black body, it has a broad spectrum, including lower radio frequencies that overlap with TV signals. Old TV antennas could pick up some of these microwave signals. 
which would then appear as static noise. So if you ever watched an old CRT TV and saw static, you were also seeing the echo of the Big Bang. We've now reached the final part of this video. To briefly summarize, Kirchhoff's challenge was to find the universal function that captures the emissive power of blackbody radiation. Kirchhoff showed that the universal function is independent of the details of the body, such as its shape, size, or material composition. This seems to point towards something very fundamental and encouraged scientists worldwide to find it. Let me now briefly walk you through what happened after this. In 1864, Irish physicist John Tyndall conducted measurements of infrared radiation emitted by a platinum filament. Tyndall is a well-known figure in atmospheric physics who discovered the greenhouse and Tyndall effects. In 1879, Austrian physicist Joseph Stefan studied the work of Tyndall and noticed that the total power emitted by a black body of one square meter surface area should go at the fourth power of the temperature. Note that this is purely an empirical result. In 1884, Stefan's formal doctoral student, Ludwig Boltzmann, published a thermodynamic derivation of Stefan's empirical law. The constant sigma is known as the Stefan-Boltzmann constant and cannot be directly obtained from purely classical mechanics. Interestingly, it was in fact Stefan who introduced Boltzmann to the work of Scottish physicist Maxwell on the kinetic theory of gases. Boltzmann would go on to dedicate his long and distinguished career to developing and expanding this theory. Many attempts were made to find Kirchhoff's universal function, but German physicist Wilhelm Franz Wien first came close. In 1896, Wien discovered a radiation law that fit the experimental data so far. It seemed Kirchhoff's challenge had finally been met. After Kirchhoff's retirement, Max Planck succeeded him as the professor of theoretical physics in Berlin. Given this, it's no surprise that Planck also developed a deep interest in Kirchhoff's challenge. However, Planck was not very satisfied with Wien's derivation of the radiation formula. Don't get me wrong. He accepted Wien's formula as some deep truth, but wanted a more rigorous derivation of it. Deep down, he also hoped that this pursuit might lead him to his ultimate goal, derive the second law of thermodynamics. However, computing the radiation law of arbitrary material would be too challenging. Fortunately, Planck knew he had no reason to worry. Kirchhoff had already proven that such a formula would be independent of the material's nature. So, Planck considered the simplest object in physics to be a harmonic oscillator. From Wien's radiation formula, Planck showed that the second derivative of the entropy is negative. This is the second law of thermodynamics. Planck was impressed by this elegant simplicity, convinced he was on the brink of a profound thermodynamic truth. Kirchhoff's challenge had finally been met. He was wrong. The harmony between theory and experiment did not last long. To Planck's consternation, experiments performed in Berlin showed that the Wien-Planck law did not correctly describe the spectrum at low frequencies. Berlin was actually the center of physics at that time. In 1895, the Berlin government tasked local scientists to determine which type of street lighting would be more economical, electricity or gas. To study the luminous intensity of lights, these scientists built a black body radiator with such unparalleled precision that they uncovered inconsistencies in the classical world. It was the most spectacular experimental success of the Berlin physicists. Something had gone wrong, and Planck had to return to his desk to reconsider why the apparently fundamental derivation produced an incorrect result. The problem, it seemed to him, lay in the definition of the oscillator's entropy. On 19 October 1900, he presented a paper titled On an Improvement of Wien's Spectral Equation at a meeting of the German Physical Society. In the same paper, he showed the expression of the famous Planck's radiation law as well. More interestingly, this version of the famous radiation law agreed perfectly with the high precision measurements within their tiny limits of error throughout the entire frequency range. This eventually earned him a Nobel Prize. This surprisingly good news had Planck desperately searching for some theoretical justification. How to interpret this new entropy expression? Here, things took a very unexpected turn. He turned to Boltzmann's probabilistic notion of entropy, which he had ignored for so long. It was during this period that he stated for the first time what has since become known as the Boltzmann equation. Yeah, Planck first wrote the equation in Boltzmann's grave. On December 14, 1900, Planck presented his seminal paper to the German Physical Society, introducing the idea of quanta, energy arriving in discrete chunks. Thus, 
quantum theory was born. Planck later described this move as an act of desperation. He recalled, For six years I had struggled with the black body theory. I knew the problem was fundamental, and I knew the answer. I had to find a theoretical explanation at any cost, except for the inviolability of the two laws of thermodynamics. The history, as you can see, is quite complex. Here's a quick chronological summary, starting with Kirchhoff's 1859 challenge and leading up to Planck's quantum hypothesis on December 14, 1900. You may have noticed that I didn't mention the ultraviolet catastrophe even once in this video. That's because it played no role in the developments leading up to Planck's work. Contrary to what's often taught in universities, quantum theory didn't owe its origin to the failure of classical physics. Rather, it arose as a natural progression in the effort to solve Kirchhoff's challenge. 